Good evening, everyone. I never had the privilege to meet Sergei Magnitsky, but through preparing his case and reading his detailed letters of complaint, his legal arguments, the records of his appearances in court, I've got to know the kind of advocate that he was. He was an advocate who always did the very best for his clients, with a burning desire for justice. He had a powerful indignation at the injustice that he witnessed. He was creative in how he responded to the situation he faced. He could tell the story of what had happened with clarity and with insight. He had an extraordinary commitment to the task, no matter what happened. He ensured that whatever he did was flawlessly executed, and he showed bravery in the face of threats and physical abuse. A man with almost unbelievable tenacity, who never gave up. Equatorial Guinea is one of the richest countries in Africa, with a high GDP due to the vast amount of oil wealth that has come in since the 1990s. It should be the Saudi Arabia of the continent, but it isn't. Instead, it is fabulously corrupt. The ruling families live lives of astounding luxury in Europe and America. Fast cars, glamorous jewelry, planes, mansions around the world. Their children in the best educational establishments that money can buy. The son of the president, Theodorin Obiang, was convicted of the criminal offense of embezzlement in France with the French authorities seizing more than 150 million euros of houses, luxury properties, and Lamborghini cars. Yet 75% of the citizens of Equatorial Guinea earn less than $2 a day, making it one of the poorest countries in the world. This poverty is entirely due to corruption. To maintain this power and the corruption, the regime relies on arbitrary detention, torture, enforced disappearance, and threats against those who dissent. As the United States government recently put it, through relentless embezzlement and extortion, Vice President Nguema Obiang shamelessly looted his government and shook down businesses in his country to support his lavish lifestyle, while many of his fellow citizens lived in extreme poverty. Civil society in Equatorial Guinea is brutally shut down if it seeks to confront the ruling families. There is no space for the protection of human rights or to challenge corruption. There are no human rights NGOs inside Equatorial Guinea as it is simply not allowed. In response to this seemingly impossible situation, the recipient of this evening's award, Tutu Alicante, created EG Justice, intending to challenge the status quo and shine a light on the corruption and human rights abuses taking place in that corner of the world. Through his work over many years, he has used the law to expose what the authorities have tried to hide and to obtain justice for the human rights violations that have taken place. In this work, he has led groundbreaking litigation to the African Commission on Human and People's Rights, challenging corruption in Equatorial Guinea. He has worked with the US authorities to gather witnesses and evidence to build an astounding asset forfeiture claim against the president's son, which led to the confiscation of a $30 million Malibu mansion, tens of millions of dollars of luxury goods, including sports cars, a plane, and memorably a diamond-encrusted glove belonging to Michael Jackson. He's brought legal claims to the United Nations on behalf of activists who are arbitrarily detained, and he's pressed for an international response to ensure their release. And most recently, he helped build the landmark criminal prosecutor of Théodore Obiang in France in the Bien Malaki case, leading to his conviction for embezzlement and the seizure of those huge amounts of funds. This is the very best of human rights lawyering, uncovering evidence and witnesses, even in very difficult circumstances, to build a case, documenting torture, arbitrary detention, disappearances, and corruption, working collaboratively with a huge range of partner NGOs and activists to build a movement that needs to be there. 
working with lawyers still based in Equatorial Guinea as far as it is possible, protecting them as part of the process, using the law creatively and his skills of persuasion, using the power of the media to get the message out. This work is dangerous. As in Russia, human rights lawyers and activists in Equatorial Guinea are put under surveillance. They are harassed, they are beaten, and worse. When he first started his legal work, Tutu's family were arrested and detained. For many years, he had to work anonymously using a pseudonym, hiding his identity to protect his family because what of, of what he did. He then realized that publicity can sometimes be the greatest form of protection and that the international community can, and in some circumstances, demonstrate their support and make the whole process safer. But the threats are still real. Human rights defenders in Equatorial Guinea are regularly detained in the notorious Black Beach prison and tortured through violent physical assaults. The threats extend to the streets of Europe, where gangs are sent to beat opponents by mysterious people finding them on the streets in the middle of the night. Like Sergei Magnitsky, Tutu Alicante is a lawyer who is prepared to risk everything to challenge corruption and human rights violations. He has made an immense contribution to the cause of human rights and to the anti-corruption community in Equatorial Guinea, in Africa, and around the world. I'm very pleased to present the 2021 Magnitsky Award for Outstanding Lawyer to Tutu Alicante. Thank you to, my, to the uh, nomination committee and uh, thank you, Bill. I am, I don't know if I have the words, I am really, really honored to receive this award named after an exceptional human being, named after a lawyer who, as both of you have mentioned, as Bill has mentioned, really personified, really embodied the meaning of uh, courage, the meaning of integrity, the meaning, the real meaning of commitment, unwavering commitment to justice. So I am indeed honored. I think it's clear that Sergei's legacy, his life, his work has already touched hundreds of millions of people. It is the only reason why I, born in an island of about a thousand people, about 4,000 miles away from Moscow, can stand here today to claim a little bit of that legacy that Sergei has established. Sergei Magnitsky's life clearly makes it present to us that corruption is not, has never been, and will never be a victimless crime. But the consequences of corruption are especially devastating in a country where endemic corruption, brutal repression, converge with dramatic consequences. And that is what we have today in Equatorial Guinea, and that's what Rupert has so beautifully described. In the early 1990s, corporations from the United States discovered oil in Equatorial Guinea. Billions of dollars transformed it from an impoverished country to the so-called Kuwait of Africa, Saudi Arabia. Yet, as Rupert mentioned, three-fourths of the people live in destitute poverty, surviving with less than $2 a day. And those might seem like numbers, but those are actual human beings. Those are my nieces, my nephews, my neighbors, people that I know very dearly. The wealth remains concentrated in one family, in one family only. In 2004, the US Senate 
found that executives from a Washington DC bank, Riggs Bank, helped divert over $700 million from state accounts into offshore shell companies on control by the president of my country. And in 2010, the Senate concluded that US lawyers, US bankers, US accountants helped the vice president of my country, who is also the son of the president, move over $100 million of illicit funds into the United States to purchase the Malibu mansion and the jets and the Lamborghinis and the largest collection of Michael Jackson memorabilia, the gloves, the jackets, and everything else. All these things are in Malabo, in the capital city of my country. But I attended the hearing in 2010 in the US Congress, and this was my very first time in the US Congress. And I watched baffled as the US lawyers and accountants and bankers who have helped laundered millions of dollars pleaded the fifth and walked out of the room completely unblemished. So the, for, for, this is the equivalent of driving the, the, the car to the bank, waiting for the thieves. The thieves come back, you pick them up, and you take the cash and the thieves and drive away. So it is no joke when some of us say that Equatorial Guinea is a mafia state. Equatorial Guinea is a criminal state. Since these events in the, in, in, in the US, France, as Rupert mentioned, Switzerland, Brazil, South Africa, all have found that the vice president of my country, with the help of Western professional enablers, stole over $500 million to support his lavish lifestyle. Now, exposing this criminality of this authoritarian kleptocracy in my country often feels like an uphill climb. Accountability, for those of us that work on these issues, can sometimes seem elusive. But there are some glimmers of hope. In just last year, we submitted a request to the US Treasury asking for global magnitsky sanctions to be imposed on the vice president of my country for his direct involvement in corruption. The US has not yet acted. But as some of you know, in July this year, the UK's government took the bold step of sanctioning the vice president of, of my country for global corruption. Just last week, along with the Cloney Foundation for Justice, we submitted a complaint to the UN Working Group on Arbitrary Detentions, requesting urgent remedies on behalf of six individuals who are currently arbitrarily detained, tortured, and deprived of fundamental due process rights. Now, I could not and I do not fight corruption and injustice alone. I cannot return home. And that's because the president of my country has labeled me a traitor and an enemy of the state. At the beginning of this year, the president of my country has accused me of being financed by George Soros, an exile novel to overthrow his regime. In case you're wondering, <laughs> if you're wondering, that's not true, <laughs> all right? Um, <laughs> but these accusations in my country would most certainly subject me to torture, sham trials, and certain death in prison. So my work is only possible because I work alongside a handful of courageous lawyers, activists, who every single day risk their lives standing up to a venally corrupt and criminal enterprise posing as a government. So I accept this award today in recognition of my collaborators' courage, in recognition of their commitment to justice and accountability. And more importantly, because of the amazing people I have met in, in this room today, I accept this award with an abiding faith in our collective ability, our collective ability to expose, to otherwise find ways to hold accountable 
all those enablers, to find ways to hold accountable all those authoritarian kleptocrats in Equatorial Guinea, throughout Africa, and around the world. So thank you very much. Thank you.